the topic of the roundtable is about um, fintech and incumbents and how to really guarantee on how to work also on a win-win um, relationship in uh, this industry for collaborations and open innovation. So my name is Beatrice de Mailleux. Uh, I'm head of innovation at Nova Reperta. So my focus is also to, uh, to really identify the current and the correct use cases to bring these companies uh, different sizes also together and work on uh, innovative projects. Uh, today, uh, we will have four speakers here also, but the really the scope is also to discuss with you guys. Is uh, first Kevin, uh, Kevin Francois uh, from uh, Sagacify. Uh, and I propose that you maybe just present yourself now very shortly yeah. already. So we are uh, Brussels based uh, AI solution uh, AI expert company. So we build AI solutions to help companies, mainly uh, insurtechs, insurance large banks, to automate most of their uh, operational processes. For example, uh, you've got like a lot of emails as insurance in your claim management process underwriting. You've got a lot of documents to manage. For example, you just you're a victim of a uh, of a car accident. There's the car crash form that you need to fill in. Then you have the the, the invoice of the ambulance, you've got the invoice of the hospital, the doctor, pharmacies, and all of that creates a lot of paperwork in emails and communication documents that the insurance has to, to, to process. And we automate all the processing of this so that the insurance can focus uh, more on the interaction with the customer and uh, helping them solve their problem, get them reimbursed much faster. Uh, and we do also many other things, but like what I, this is an example of how we automate operational processes for the insurance industry. Thank you. Uh, Tamas, Tamas Brown, uh, welcome. You are head of uh, international sales as at WOP. I that hope I pronounced it right. That, <laughs> is, that is correct, exactly. Um, yeah, so my name is Tamas Brown. I indeed work as a head of sales for, for the company. Um, the company is about digital banking. So we do provide digital banking solutions for financial institutions, as you can imagine, all the boring bits, the transactional functionality. But maybe the interesting bit is how to make this personalized. So if you bank with Fortis or Belfius or ING's, uh, mostly you would get very similar experience, even if you're an 18 year old who's just starting off the job or someone who is close to retirement or someone who lives abroad or someone who, who actually is from the Middle East and just moved here. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to personalize this digital banking experience according to who you are. So looking at your data as a customer and creating those personalized interactions which make it very much meaningful and relevant to you as a digital banking experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bjorn, Bjorn van Gaak, a business consultant at Altares. Welcome. Thank you. So Altares, but also, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so Altares, we're basically part of kind of franchise of the larger Dunner Brassery Corporation and what our actually our business is all about. We have, let's say, a large data cloud with which covers 450 million businesses. So we provide information about those businesses uh, and we actually provide that information to, let's say, the higher end of the SME market, but also to the larger corporates. Uh, and we help businesses, for example, become uh, more compliant. We focus on AML anti-money laundering, we focus on credit scoring, so uh, the credit management departments of, uh, of our clients, they use our data, our insight to actually see if it's, um, if it's a good idea to go in business with a certain uh, client, uh, and many more, let's say, business cases or business processes that we support, both from a tooling perspective, data perspective, integration perspective, so integration in SAP, for example. Um, and we also have an analytics department which actually builds scorecards for our clients and, and also in co uh, cooperation with banks, for example. Yeah. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And then Olivier, Olivier Durand, you are at uh, PwC. Uh, you're working on the governance, risk and compliance. That's correct. So um, I think most of you will uh, be familiar with PwC. So it's one of the big four uh, auditing firms. Uh, why am I here in this panel today? I uh, conducted and co-authored some research, market research on bank fintech collaboration in Belgium in the beginning of this year. Uh, I was also part of the PwC um, scale-up uh, innovator. So we, we took on board about a dozen fintechs and uh, helped them get connected or introduced them to some of our Belgian clientele. 
And then lastly, um, more uh, out of my day-to-day -day job, I work uh, within uh, governance, risk and compliance, like you mentioned, but mostly in project management or consulting assignments to banks and insurance firms, which we are not auditing. And in that role, I sometimes help uh, financial institutions get connected with certain third parties if these solutions uh, can, can help the banks implement um, regulatory projects, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, and maybe for us also, just to understand uh, from what sector you are also in the audience, who is from more like a smaller entity or a fintech? Uh, okay, and so I suppose then you are uh, more from a bigger organization then. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for representing that target, <laughs> okay. Good, um, le let's first start with setting the scene also, and, and uh, I read, I like that sentence, like startups are from Venus and corporates are from Mars. Uh, so it's, they are very different, uh, of course, but when it matches, when the collaboration is, has a very good understanding on what they both want to do, then it's really like a marriage in heaven. Um, I would first like to, to maybe uh, give you the words, uh, Kevin, on uh, what do you see really as benefits also for these closer collaborations and, and you know, in, in different kind of or types of collaboration models, of course, but what are the main benefits for a startup perspective then? Okay. Um, so just to clarify, so we've been f created in 2013, we made a massive pivot in 2018 to be only focused on AI solutions and then we, we you kind of see like, a large, like faster growth from that point. And so now we're qualified as a, as a scale up somehow because we're 25 people and so like business is growing. So we, we feel that we found the, the market, product market fit. And so there is different a differentiation between a startup working with a, a, a larger corporation and a, and a, and a scale-up. Um, we can come back to that point later. Um, but as an AI company working for a larger firm, the first advantage I see is that, first of all, big companies are sitting on a lot of data. And for an AI company, if you don't feed us with data, we can't do anything. So but you don't necessarily have to have like truckloads of data. Also, some s sometimes small data is enough. More data is always better. Um, but that's, that's the start of a, of, a, of, a, of a collaboration. Without big firms, we can't do much. Also, us, we are domain ex uh, we're domain, uh, we're technology experts. We're not domain experts. We're not insurers. We're not bankers. And so we don't know the problem that you are facing. On the other hand, we're technological specialists and passionate people. And it's by collaborating together that I think that we can create the best innovations. And then there is also... Um, to, to me, the, s the speed at which you can do it. Uh, uh, as a, as from the corporate point of view, you'd say, okay, why would I want to collaborate with a startup? Well, my point of view is that it's the speed of execution. I think that a big corporate can't be good at everything, like at AI, blockchain, NFTs, metaverse, and, and so on. And so I think that relying on the quality and, and the trustworthy service of a startup can help accelerate their go-to-market with their ID. For, for example, that's yeah. uh, that is on the top of my head. There are more more points that I would like to develop later, but uh, well that's a good start. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I see that also uh, with the first point. Is my mic on? Yeah, yeah, it's oh yeah sorry. Uh, with the first point about the data, so we sit a lot of uh, on a lot of data, obviously, and um, so uh, we are cooperating with a uh, with a microfinancing company, uh, or at least we sell our, our services to them, and they had an issue at the beginning of their. Uh, basically of their venture, of their adventure, is that you know, they made losses. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a simple reason for that, because they didn't have the, um, the right credit scoring model uh, in place. So they couldn't really see if this you know, new client was going into default within six months or maybe two years, whatever. Um, so we actually helped, and after a couple of years, we built a, a new credit scoring model for them, and we also fed them with data. Um, and now, of course, they did a whole bunch of other things to become, you know, uh, to have those uh, thick black figures. But uh, they, they did a tremendous job, uh, job, but also just using a credit scoring model based on a lot of data. And the, the other part that I also wanted to, uh, to talk about is uh, indeed also maybe a little bit of risk appetite. I mean, uh, smaller companies, fintechs, have a, a, a you know, more risk appetite. Uh, compared to larger corporates. So that's also, I think, if things are going in the right direction, you can also celebrate successes quicker. Um, and so that's... 
But if we take that, that risk, uh, uh, so the trust notion, that risk notion, how can you just you know, make these bigger corporations uh, gain more trust also in such an open collaboration? Because for them, they are scared that or the company would you know, disappear <laughs> or what if goes wrong or, oh my God, my reputation, this is so important. So yeah, G go ahead also if you yeah. have, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can fully resonate with what Kevin said about data and speed and all that. But I think there is one element maybe slightly related to this question is the human aspect of this. So as a fintech company, we, we have about 600 people now. Um, but I bet that if I have to hire 20 more engineers, mm -hmm. data scientists, I can find probably the same people that the banks are hunting for as well. And not to offend everyone here, but... Those guys want to work with the Googles, with the fintechs, with the trendy companies. They don't want to go with the big old bank where they cannot get anything done in a short time of period, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we've seen a lot of people like that. And they would rather choose a fintech company where they can grow and they can expand their knowledge than stuck in a bank where sometimes, and again, I'm not trying to offend anyone here from a bank, but they they cannot do as much as quickly or, or even learn or, or be in an environment where, where they can pick up a lot of other new technologies. Yeah. Uh, that is not true for all the other banks. There are a lot of incubators. There's fantastic things going on in, in a lot of the banks, not to say this. But again, there is a perception in terms of people that the fintech is somehow more sexy, dare I say, than, than going with a big bank. Mm -hmm. It's true that we are surrounded by people driven by creating an impact on the, on the, on the society yeah. quickly and faster and also quickly uh, improve their, their, their technical skills. And this is yeah. an environment that you can find in a small company and potentially less in a big company. So that's, of course, also a reason, a benefit for then the bigger organization is that speed. So it's yeah. also... Uh, it's speed and also tackling into a pool of talent, talent with the yeah. right culture to execute fast and quality mm. products. Yeah. Uh, yeah that they could not potentially find internally, potentially. Yeah. Although that they're aware of this problem, they're creating all those incubator, internal yeah. approach uh, initiatives and so forth. If you, if you think of the subject of behavioral science and, and trying to understand how people behave from data, that is a very specific niche subject, right? And, and y you need the mix of, of technologists, mathematicians, statisticians, and psychologists potentially, or, or that sort of people. And literally these guys they, they just don't they're not present in banks right mm -hmm. they don't want to work for banks or they never worked for banks they're not in the finance industry so even as a technologist we need to hunt these people and explain to them why your skills are very relevant to a technology company who provides financial solutions yeah uh, uh. olivier also taking into account on that reputation uh mm -hmm. for, for the bigger H how is from your experience also see how you can you know control this or or um is yep. there too much control instead or no well uh, is there too much control it's 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 not always a matter of banks wanting to control exert that much control it's also a matter of banks having to exert uh, a minimal amount of control the the regulatory framework has al it's been strict for a long time but it's only becoming more strict and now with uh, gdpr since about 2 to 3 years having come into place that alone makes that any third party that wants to go into business with a bank before you even can start having in-depth discussions, you can expect to get a list of questions, like a GDPR pre-check, um, some of which uh, a, a, not, a, non, a not so very prepared fintech would have a lot of problems in dealing with it because those questions, I've, I've seen them, I've sent these questionnaires to, uh, to third parties, to fintechs, uh, and, and uh, they often go above and beyond what some fintechs were expecting. You almost need uh, uh, a small uh, legal team or at least one legal expert to be able to deal with, with those questions. And, and uh, it's not just that. Th then on top comes the, the outsourcing uh, guidelines. Again, uh, another piece of regulation that banks have to deal with. That again, uh, then we're not even talking about uh, cybersecurity. Um, so yeah, it, it's a lot of control. But and isn't that then a risk, you know, from the fintech side? If you spend a lot of time on all this regulation and you know p showing a pat blanche or a carte blanche or how do you call it, uh, to lose in fact the focus on on what's your growth uh, target or uh, how would you? And in also here because I know we have some. Uh, so if you really want to also uh, intervene into yeah. Go.
There is a mic. Yeah, I think it's is on. Yeah. So, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So, uh, my own opinion would be that this, on the long term, if it continues that way, would be healthy to for the ecosystem. That the the split between the expertise from from the fintech companies and the financial institutions, so that as you as you would say. Uh, some data scientists or engineers prefer to go to fintech companies, uh, and yeah, others who are, for example, analysts maybe would work more for bank for banks or or uh, consulting companies like uh, PwC mm -hmm. or KPMG or or uh, yeah firms that actually give uh, yeah um, I would say uh, separate advice. But do you see actually that this is how the market is going? Or at some point, the big players or the banks would feel like the fintech companies as suppliers have more leverage that they control which technology or or they are part of the chain that's actually not under their control, which used to be historically under their control, that then they start developing their own or acquiring some fintech companies. Then there is like a switch into the, the, the power balance between fintechs and, and the bigger or, and, and then a second maybe linked also is if there is an acquisition, do you tend then also, you know, to, to lose the, the, that startup spirit and that startup mindsets after a, a full acquisition or you said, yeah, or are there concrete models, maybe also based on your experience, better models that are recommended in that? Yeah, I also want to come back on uh, what, uh, your statement, earlier yeah. statement, just for, for a second, perhaps. So I think uh, you know, on what you said, so when you send out those, those questionnaires, whatever, um, so the, we know, all know perhaps that the ABA, you know, they have strong regulations about you know, the uh, IT yeah. uh, infrastructure of, uh, of banks. Um, but you know, so on one hand, so the, the, the story has two sides. On one hand, you know, this uh, can bring tremendous effort for a fintech or a startup company to actually answer all those questions, to actually have all the the, the right inf infrastructure, in the IT and the cybersecurity infrastructure in place. But the payback uh, or the return, sorry, it's a better word, is also tremendous. Uh, I think because you also you know we gain a lot of knowledge uh, about what is being asked, because if you if you are expanding and you uh, come to the understanding that your own infrastructure is actually hitting the, its boundaries of what is sustainable, also from IT perspective and cybersecurity perspective, you're basically too late and maybe need to reinvest. Um, and I've actually had that experience, not at a mm -hmm. smaller company, but also as an incumbent, but totally different. But we were introducing a new uh, service, actually content services, so with also AI uh, uh, and M ML uh, technology. So, and we were actually talking to a large um, insurance company and they said, well, uh, this is, sounds great. We can outsource this process to you guys. And then, okay, well, let's sign. And then all, all of a sudden IT security stepped in and said, oh, wait, 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 wait. Can you please fill in this, this, and this, and this? And we, <laughs> even though we were a large corporate, we actually hadn't th thought about it and we had to go back. But again, the return of investment of that time and expenses was, was great. So yeah. there was I a, I agree. Could you get around? Could you get around that IT security somehow? I, I've heard a case. I think it was either here or in the Netherlands, ING, hmm. where I can't recall the exact details, but they did something which went against compliance really heavily. Like it was a public site where you had to put your account number so you can take advantage of a great savings rate, uh, Lions oh. savings account, yeah. something like mm -hmm. that. And the guy stood on stage and said they've done this project. Everyone from IT security, compliance, legal, did not approve this because it looked very dodgy that an unsecured site you put an account number in. And he asked one question. If I do this, am I going to go to jail? Mm. If the answer is no, then I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So he's breaking things because he clearly saw that if I go into that, they would not allow me to do it. You have to authenticate before you put your account number in. But it was silly because it was your own money anyway. So who in their right mind would, would send their own money to someone else's account? No one would do that. Um, so literally it worked and it was public for a long time. It was a 
textbook case study how not to get bound by IT security, okay. even if you're going against rules. But he was an employee of ING. He was an employee okay. of ING. So okay. But yeah. it's, it's an interesting point because is that a turnaround for bigger organizations? Is it to say then, okay, do something, but we call it, we, we give the, 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 the product or the solution that you're going to do a totally different name. We are not going to brand it. We are even creating sometimes another venture uh, that is totally standalone. Or isn't that then a solution, you know, to to avoid compliance and yeah, IT? Uh, exactly. Or just try to not do it the old-fashioned way. So whatever works. I, I don't know what you guys think about the procurement process which some of the fintechs the banks have to go through. It's a sometimes a six months long process mm. with questionnaires like 259 questions on feature shows. Literally, have you got this feature? And then fintechs are scored and compared and evaluated based on this. Is this right? Are you really going to choose the best solution provider based on 250 questions? Or can you actually get around this? Like the procurement will not allow you to, to get mm. around it. But mm -hmm. as a business stakeholder in a bank, can you actually do something not to get bound down by this process? From, from what I've seen, um, uh, I would doubt it. I think it, it's an impressive example, the, the, the one you cited from ING, but that, that's one example of one company. I yeah. think it's, it's, it's very dependent on the culture within each specific bank. And I think in general, the answer today would still be that you cannot expect that because it worked at ING once, you will be able to bypass uh, the procur procurement and, and cybersecurity and uh, the DPO at all the other banks I... I would tend to uh, think otherwise. but So maybe we're getting to the point, yeah. and then when what is the, the biggest collaboration challenges between a large bank and the fintechs, and some of these clearly, right? Are, are clearly that. Uh, uh. I, I just want to say that it's, uh, I think that it's also very healthy, uh, those GDPR regulations. I think it's set the stage. There's a reason. It's for forced the, the discussion mm. to open up, and at least uh, we evolved that after that in transparency. But we've seen that indeed with the, lar the, the lar larger the company, the longer the list of questions mm -hmm. is, and sometimes it can take a long, it can take a long time, up to a point where uh, we've got some projects that were blocked and also some projects that had to be, they were in production for a year, and then uh, all of a sudden IT, there they, they had been the Cloud Act. There is a Cloud Act at mm -hmm. the moment, uh, like saying that even if the, your data is now residing in Europe, in Europe yeah. but from an American cloud, at the time it was fine. The US couldn't like potentially mm -hmm. uh, come and see what you were doing, I mean, the, the data. Now, apparently, they, ca they can. Yep. And so there's a whole, like, uh, wrecking havoc among all of our customers because they want to change everything. They want to go back to OVH, you know, which is a French uh, cloud mm -hmm. provider, yep. get rid yeah. of Google, IBM, and so forth. And so sometimes I feel that there is too much risk aversion in the large corporation because I think that the lo risk is extremely low, but they are putting a lot of barrier to innovation because they want to make sure that they are, that there is absolutely no risk. And risk zero doesn't exist, but the risk is extremely low, and some of that I think that it's a bit exaggerated, all the things that we have to go through to get a project approved. Yeah. And so maybe also on your experience, is it easier or not as rigid in the US for these kind of collaborations then? Because we are speaking about all the checkpoints uh, here. Is it there maybe m more? I have no idea. I have no customer. I don't know the if there is the any US. reference from uh, or or. Uh, Maybe we also don't work in the US, but but yeah, I think it's so even worse. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. In in defense of these organizations, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, in defense of these organizations, banking industry is the or one of the most regulated industry, right? So they they rightly very scared of, mm -hmm. of a, a mm. PR disaster or security breach or GDPR compliance and all that. So they're being absolutely overcautious, but it's just in their culture as banks for hundreds of years to be cautious. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, at this age, I don't <coughs> think it's guaranteed. I, I agree, but it is what it is. But the simple fact that they are not willing to go to the cloud, large bank, for example, like we've been, I mean, the cloud has been around for like 10 years uh, minimum and like banks mainly are still not there or yeah. not trusting mm. it well I, that also yeah. th it's th starting that's, that's also because see, yeah. but um it's a super slow uh, mm. um, slow factor to innovation compared to potentially other countries that would not uh, be and other so sectors because and uh, other uh, sectors uh, yeah. yeah other sectors are moving sir yeah. you wanted to uh yeah fear of taking the risk
So they all prefer to have more like a, yeah, a protective posture then? then they the don't want to wet themselves in a sense. Yeah. Or no one wants to take the risk of s bearing and supporting this initiative maybe. Mm. Yeah, once yeah. one did it, then the other follow. Yeah. But you have... Yeah. Taking the risk. Yeah. So it's That's difficult, but <coughs> they need it. So, yeah. 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 But then it's an acquisition. Then it's a total acquisition, and then it can start. Yeah. Okay. That's where regulation, uh, the banks being so heavily regulated, that alone can sometimes also help banks push them over the limits to try something new, because sometimes there is a piece of new regulation that forces the banks to be able to do things that they don't have the skill sets or the systems for. And then you can, uh, well, that can be, sometimes regulation can be a reason for a bank to try something new. It's what I uh, wanted to get at. If you take, for example, the whole KYC issue, yeah. you see all banks have to follow all these regulations mm -hmm. because the anti money laundering, anti uh, money, um, and uh, uh, terrorism financing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing they are doing is ticking a box. They're not putting intelligence in how they can really find uh, money laundering or terrorism finance, but the, what they do is every transfer of 100 euros from somebody sending 100 euros to their, uh, their grandparents in Syria, then the alarms will, will ring, mm -hmm. and uh, then say, like, hey, we found something that might be terrorism, but like, that's good, like 100 euros. Yeah. So <laughs> is there <laughs> any automation <laughs> in that possible, maybe? Because uh, indeed, it's very much check in the boxes and you have to repeat always the same uh, questions like I, I'm, I'm uh. sure that there is it's not it's not our business why because it's so close to the business that basically you would have to be acquired to 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 to, to, to be so close to the domain experts within the, the the bank to to work hand in hand and, and build that technology for them because they wouldn't allow you as, as, as a fintest fin fin to, to build their own system because then I could be able to resell it or, or I would have IP on this I mean that well and yeah. uh, and so what I wanted to say here is that um, Forgot. You go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you will be back. Back. Um, yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I mean, I can't fully respond to the question, but I do see uh, more and more automation within the banks. What I see as development, development now uh, that they are building, let's say, huge enterprise data lakes, so to really close all the gaps and all the white spots, uh, and I also use, I think, uh, automation within transaction monitoring. Mm -hmm. So, if, for example, they ex you if they expect that. Company B is uh, will pay an invoice, and the company B should be in Italy, and then the invoice is paid by uh, someone in Russia. Mm -hmm. Then I think the alarm bells ring will ring, yeah. uh, and that is also based on okay, they they have family structures in in um, you know they they build the family structures of all their clients. You see who the beneficial owners is, so they can expect where the money should flow from. Um, and so if that is not within the family structure, not within the beneficial ownership structure, then uh, red flags could indeed um, go up. Go up yeah. And actually we s also see it with our clients that they actually are called by the bank, maybe it's also what you, you say, but that they are actually, th they saying to their clients, well, you're not complying because you're receiving money from a high risk country, which is on the FATF list, mm. uh, whilst you ex we expect your money to come from Italy or Austria, whatever. Okay. But, but why so. do you think, I think you raised a very interesting point, mm. that why do you guys think that banks are not so keen on, on coming up with new ideas for anti-money laundering, for example? You said it's ticking a box and it's done, but they're not putting the extra effort into really coming up with something new. So why do you think that is? But yeah. is it always also then a way for the bank to show that they are not obsolete, that they you know they need to continue that kind of? Uh, 
Yeah. Well, I'm sorry yeah. if uh, I don't know from where you are, but it was <laughs> no. Well, well, tell us, tell us. Well, not the well, bank. Well, <laughs> just one consideration. It's interesting what you're discussing, and I fully agree with you. But there are different, uh, a different model, at least one, probably several different models. Uh, I work for a, f a middleman, let's say, in the value chain. Okay. Uh, but what we have is that we've developed a, um, a program with partner fintechs. Mm -hmm. Because we're trusted by the banks, okay. long-lasting rela long relationships, because we do the, the due diligence ourselves, mm -hmm. because we facilitate not the integration but the financial model between mm -hmm. these parties. So in a way, we're not enabler, we are facilitators. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes simpler because the banks by transitivity <coughs> trust us and yeah. therefore we'll trust the partners we bring. On the other side, we have to carefully select the yeah. partners because we have to give that element of trust. And in the, in the end, it's kind of a win, 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 whatever you call it situation yeah. because the banks are happy, the FinTech is happy, yeah. and we are happy because we're providing an additional service. service. Uh, may I ask the name of the company? Visa. Yeah, so yeah. you know that's that's a way also of, uh, and I'm not saying that it's the it's the right model to to pursue, yeah, yeah, yeah. but at least it's a different way of looking at the problem of collaboration, yeah. which makes fully sense. And I and I w it was interesting to hear you with your own experiences on the problems that you <coughs> face and that yeah. I fully I fully get yeah. because we're on the same boat. It's just that we come from a different angle because in at, at the beginning we are spin off of, of, of banks, huh? yeah, <laughs> let's yeah. face it. Yeah. Uh, and so we have this relationship that allows us also to bring these fintechs because we rely on you, as someone said, the expertise you have, the time to market you bring. We don't have that. Mm. So what's the point to do it ourselves? Yeah. Well, so any well, experience on just, you know, what he said, or what, what's, um, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, I don't know your name, but. Guillaume. So Guillaume. Guillaume. Guillaume said and you know by also the use of that trusted middleman party or but there there, there are many multiple models of collaboration yeah. uh like a mm. bank could look out for a product fintech to acquire because they've got the, the very thing that they need and it's perfect and since it's a product it's like very well done very highly qualitative or they'd say no we want something new i uh, want something innovative uh uh, very advanced and so they might want to say okay we want to build it in ourselves but we don't have the resources internally to build it so we'll we'll we'll, we'll try to find like startup like like many or like any other to say okay hey, come help us build it but then since it's so sensitive data like the transaction data a little bit like healthcare data like you if you want to touch it you need to go to a bunker with no internet connection and then you can work on it um, that's also like definitely slow down innovation and also slow down collaboration because the, the amount of work that you have to go through to start the collaboration and, e and, and, and interest people to come work on the project is very, very little. We have some uh, past experience with this, with large bank working on a credit scoring and uh, fraud detection system. We built some very innovative things, but it never went in production because it was too hard to for the regula regulatory point of view and also implementation point of view, it was out mm. of our hands and it never, never happened. Um, voilà. But so voilà, uh, uh, what's your point of view regarding the different multiple models, like build it yourself, g getting help for it, or buying like existing products? Uh, uh, what do you see most? Um, These large organizations, they, they they understand how they are, their DNA, and they know that they are not, uh, they don't have the expertise, they, they are not fast to develop because of the constraints that you mentioned and so on. Mm. So they have to rely on others. And I think that everybody agrees with that. Now it's how we do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it requires also skills to identify the right partner, time to dedicate to that risk. Someone mentioned, I think you mentioned mm -hmm. it, to take risk internally, you know, to kind of, stand up and say, yeah, these guys are good. We want to work with them. So in a way, we are in a position where uh, at least I think it's an interesting model because we facilitate that because we actually do the job at the beginning to select and identify first and select uh, what we believe are right partners in our industry mm -hmm. or that yeah. fit also with what we bring, what we do. It has al always to be related to your core business. Otherwise, there's no point. And then mm -hmm. we come and we say, okay, you can take that. We've done some due diligence up front. You can benefit from that if you want to. And, and that also eases the, the discussion. And for the fintech partner, it, it brings scale. Because yep. in front of us, we have you know, plenty of, of potential customers. Mm. So 
you know, that's also something that, in a way, could um, foster the development of, of fintechs, for example. I think still, uh, it's regardless of what model we're talking about here, the, the speed of this collaboration is still extremely slow compared to what the fintechs are used to mm -hmm. by themselves, yeah. right? By so themselves. So we, yeah. we, we're going at light speed. I've got five competitors in front of and behind me, and they simply would not let me rest. I don't see the same type of urgency from the other side, right? <laughs> And yeah. I don't know if it's because of the size. I mean, if I've got a billion dollar pound profit as one of the biggest British banks and sitting on that, and do I need to really break my back to do something? Yeah. Or am I comfortable with this? I've got a fairly good market share. Yes, KBC, Belfius, ING, all these guys would have a good balanced market share. They innovate every now and then they do the same. But I don't see that really breaking their yeah. back on trying to do something. But I would like to jump on that. And Olivier, mm -hmm. we had a chat just before starting on all that beyond banking uh, offers now. And isn't that a very right moment then for the fintechs to to take that speed on, on that beyond banking experience on other sectors or initiatives? Mm -hmm. While yep. maybe for the bank, they, they are s slower? Y yeah, well, uh, it, it's a fact that if, if you if you just scan the market for all of the, the partnership announcements, uh, mentions of collaborations between mm -hmm. banks and third parties, you do see a very rapid increase just in the sheer frequency of these kinds of announcements. As of 2018, really, it's it's been really exploding. And that goes together with the banks, uh, especially the, the universal, the big ones, uh, like the Belfuse, the KBC, uh, wanting to become... Uh, ecosystems or platforms of their own rights and that's that has two reasons uh, it's of course to um, um, to attract more customers but it's also defensive in that it's 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 intended to make sure that they keep the customers that they have and it's also designed to defend themselves from future inroads by the GAFAs, uh, which they are, uh, yeah. of course, all looking towards. Uh, they've all sent their uh, executive committees to China, I'm, I'm sure, uh, to, to become inspired by, by Tencent mm -hmm. and whatnot. So that's certainly <coughs> in the back of their minds as they, as they build um, these, these ecosystems. And you see that uh, partially. It's, of course, still financial services driven, but increasingly, the more and more we go towards the looking at partnerships in the re in the most recent years, it goes beyond what is traditionally Bank. banking services. Uh, I think the most recent example is uh, real estate. You see several banks really wanting to build out a home pillar or a housing pillar in their ecosystem because uh, I think two at least, <coughs> or more than two of them, have actually t taken an equity participation in real estate platforms. Uh, you have uh, Belfuse has bought a part of Imovlan, KBC has bought a part of Imoscoop, yeah. Uh, and there are other examples, but... Uh, th th yeah, I think it's new revenue models as well, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So retail banking I it is what it is, right? So it's very hard to make a decent profit yeah. on just pure current accounts. So you need to go look beyond that to actually make revenue or create new revenue streams. Beyond banking, it, it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also when you, as a big firm, big bank, big insurance firm, uh, when you are working with startup, this is a question that hasn't been addressed, I think. No, no, no. Um, when you want to differentiate yourself, uh, protect yourself against disruption, and things like that, you want to work with startup for that like, pace of innovation and so, and, and so forth. But at some point, aren't you afraid to lose the control of this technology, this innovation, this IP, and just like working with a bunch of services, but in, this, in, in the end, you not having embraced you know, the, the future and not being able to control and understand this technology. And so my question to the audience and to big firms is, how much do, we, do you value keeping in control of those new technologies uh, that are going to be core, potentially core business tomorrow? We, I have my point of view, and I think that it's important for companies to stay in control. And this is our vision. We want to push back the control to the technology we build to them so that mm -hmm. even if we're not there tomorrow, they can still work without us because the whole framework of using the service is still is going to be pushed on in order hand but yeah. what do you think about this control of the technology from of tomorrow th that could be disruptive for you yeah i would even add on top of that that in my view it's it's uh, it's a very good uh, angle that you it's a very good principle to have as a fintech to make sure that the banks that you you sell your services to maintain the control or at least know what they're getting into when they when they go into business with you because it's again it's a matter of regulation 
You cannot outsource something as a bank to a third party, especially if it, reply, if it uh, applies to uh, internal control services, yeah, no. things that are core to your business. You cannot outsource something um, and not be able to explain it anymore to your supervisor. That will never pass, and uh, it, it's going to stay that way for the future. So I think what, y what you're doing is, is a must. But I would say. If but I can yeah, for, for not only then for core banking, mm. eh, if you talk about uh, emo in real estate yeah, industry, okay. or mm. even for entrants, which are maybe a little bit less regulated, mm. you could lose control of the technology that you are using to stay on top of, the comp of your competition. Mm. Uh, but losing control is not being able to make the right decisions tomorrow, rather mm. than making sure that you have, you have like, embraced and uh, acquired somehow the knowledge to be to use it yourself can still get you going for the future you mentioned the challenges on on the bank side right when you're dealing with potentially hundreds of these suppliers and and a bit half of those a large portion of those suppliers they would have vc money behind it who would want to exit at some point mm -hmm. sell the company or upsell the company or acquired by visa or something else so imagine the sort of resistance to have hundreds of suppliers and they keep changing the corporate structure every year or so. So how difficult could that be? And again, losing control in the process of all this. So I think I, I will completely yeah. understand that as a bank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, you have the other uh, opinion or point of view that you will be missing out some, uh, some technologies that are emerging that services can be offered to your customers and you can scale up a bit or get more business when you have this, but you'll lose it. If you, if you see a company that's <coughs> offering uh, some, some technologies that you are actually not offering, maybe other bank will, will acquire this or, or adopt this and you lost it. Or you need to then work with Visa to make sure that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, you agree because that's something that you can start with a partner to develop something that you don't know, you don't okay, you don't know how to do it. So then you kind of integrate that afterwards so you are in control of that new technology, for example. So they, there could be different steps. So from first like you know, like a, a collaboration, a partnership, whatever, then to move on to more and an integration or to uh, yeah, it's like you know you're not getting married from one day to another. Yeah, I'll definitely advise to start small. I yeah. think big and start small. And so I think that to discover if a relationship is going to be profitable, uh, definitely start on a project that can deliver value like in the next 6 to 12 months. Yeah. But if it, if it, even if it's not the best value, uh, but better to start with a project with a small value but is guaranteed to succeed so that you get the ball rolling, you know the, the partner, you, you got into a relationship that fruitful, and then you can, uh, you know, start succeeding. Uh, progressively, iteratively work on other projects. But I would not then advise to work on a big project at no, first. And maybe also um. a question that I have on that point and also for everyone here is, is it then a fast, can we say that, for example, if a fintech is working with a big bank here in Belgium, for example, ING, let's take the same, will it uh, also um, uh, inc uh, or accelerate his collaboration with the ING group worldwide? And is it then also like an accelerator for the startup to really go in the whole group, or do you say no? It's it's like ever yeah. again starting the same compliance. It depends and on the banks, right? Yeah. So if it's if the case of ING, probably yes. Yeah. But if you talk about some other banking groups who are much more decentralized yeah. and and the left arm wouldn't care about what the right arm is doing, and I'm simply not going to go with whatever central solution, then then probably you have no chance to do that. So the scale up is impossible in that yeah. group. Yeah. yeah, it depends. So certainly, if, if you're a, a reg tech and you're more in the, the to the regulatory assistance yeah. type service offering, then yeah, your solution may work well yeah. for a bank in member state X, but not be that relevant in member state Y. Uh, yeah. But th there is one example I think of a, a firm that started out Belgian and did become global. I th believe it's called Guard Square. They started as um, oh yeah. they do the the cybersecurity for the mobile applications of banks. So they make sure mm -hmm. that the mobile application of a bank cannot be reverse engineered mm. and re, uh, replaced yes. on the App Store under a by a fraudulent, fraudulent institution. And they started in Belgium, but they, they grew. Uh, they, they, they took their contacts and relationship with the Belgian banks and managed to leverage that into really global success as doing uh, the security for mobile applications uh, globally. So 
it can, it can generic, happen. It yeah. can be then, uh, yeah. yeah. What are you going to say? Sir? No, well, that's a, a very good example of where a collaboration with a small company, which is maybe maybe it was a spin-off of the Kraju Leuven, you who knows? But this uh, is a brilliant company. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, Guard Square is like really a well, uh, well-known also. Or maybe so with the at the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but so a positive, uh, let's say a positive development where also, you know, uh, um, so I've been also was in touch with a uh, with a vendor for I mean identity is hot right now right mm. so and also uh, to affect our authentication or, or or MFA where you know where banks said well we love your technology mm. but you know uh, indeed about the uh, the topic we just had but you know your two year old company and we we can't risk it that you you're out of business in in uh, in two years or have been uh, let's say uh, if there was a a takeover from another company. So uh, I mean, there are good examples uh, examples where it can work, where they have the they, the risk capital because they love the technology, because they believe in the technology. And sometimes, uh, well, yeah, it really much depends on the bank. And these are yeah. moments then where uh, Altares can then also work on a scoring risk for 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 these kind of companies, or. Yeah, well, then we're talking about a whole different topic, but yeah, but, but yes, I mean, for example, now, um, I mean, banks are now looking at, for example, PSD two scoring. Yeah. Uh, so PSD2, open banking, uh, but you know, uh, working with smaller companies uh, that do microfinancing, uh, but uh, <coughs> they basically don't have, let's say, um, they don't have a PSD uh, license, so they need to work with uh, intermediates that can provide the data, but you're not, not allowed to store it, so you can't build a, m a risk, uh, credit scoring model on it. So there are other companies that do, p that, well, for example, banks that are now working on a PSD uh, credit score that they actually want to market to fintech companies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because uh, so the the smaller microfinancing companies can d then use the PSD score of a large in institutional bank just to do a credit risk assessment of those uh, of those applicants that want to have a microfinancing. And that's so. That's also quite an interesting collaboration. An interesting example. And you spoke also when we prepared the session about that example, uh, the diagnosis tool. In the uh, in the Netherlands. Oh yeah, that's for for the SME markets where so <coughs> this is basically uh, uh, indeed a collaboration between you know, uh, a larger Dutch bank, a microfinancing company, go local governments and national governments, and where all we also participate. So uh, we provided some advice and we also provide data uh, where basically a a um, an SME or a smaller s or solo company can actually do a diagnosis online. And basically, an advice will pop up, uh, pop out um, uh, based on uh, the input of uh, the bank, the microfinancing, us, but also different instances, mm -hmm. and also the chamber of commerce, saying, "Well, this is our advice, and you can do uh, maybe do a loan, or maybe yeah. <laughs> even let's say an exit, mm -hmm. whatever." Uh, but that's a, that's also a good uh, form, let's say, um, well, example of a collaboration, but which is not int it's non-profit. So no. it's not, let's say, for profit no, initiative. I, just yeah. I had a thought triggered in my head while you were speaking that this collaboration and the advantage of uh, for a bank uh, to collaborate with fintechs. Do you think there's a point where, for example, let's pick a bank, Raiffeisen, in, in Europe, right, based out of Austria. They, mm. they, they have uh, about 15 countries across Europe. So if I work for Raiffeisen as a fintech and, and in the business of data, and mm. I can figure out insights, I can figure out spending patterns, which are quite useful for Raiffeisen as a group, and they can leverage this across their countries. Mm. Um, as a fintech, uh, my interest would be to bring the same proposition to KBC, where mm -hmm. they actually have an overlap in like three countries, and they compete against each other. So why would Raiffeisen allow me to do this, to go and sell the same insights, which potentially could result in increased revenue for KBC? Uh, uh, they have a common interest. They don't want to have defaults. So uh, th so that's their common interest. It's not to gain market, but it's the to, to uh, minimize the risk, to mitigate risk. So, and that's the common, let's say, uh, the, the well common well advantage well. that they have. Yeah. So in in uh, AI, we differentiate two things. We differentiate the, um, the value that we can build for a customer based on their data. So everything that we can leverage from the data of our customers, that's our customer's IP. And then you've got the knowledge that we've acquired mm -hmm. working on their data. So if, for example, we create value, we found like a, an amazing transaction fraud detection system for a bank, okay, we won't be able to reuse the data to train our algorithm mm -hmm. that we use for that bank, but we could reuse the knowledge to do the same to another bank. And so 
voilà, this is where the IP could sometimes be split, and that's what we practice. Uh, mm. So the time it's okay, but um, mm. I don't know if you have an opinion on this. Uh. Also, I'd like to uh, add some. Uh, I have point of view from uh, from our experience, Walter. Walter and I we work for the same company, Soluzio, and also coming back to the point where you can leverage on. Uh, whether you're going to be as a, as, a, as a joint venture or a corporate venture, because we, Soluzio, we're a corporate venture. We were born three years ago uh, as a result of the marriage between KBC and a fintech company, and, uh, mm. and we offer our services to KBC. And uh, I've been listening to a lot of your points, uh, procurement and, and, and compliance and speed and, and, and uh, finding the right people, uh, and, and you name it. And we've all gone through that. I mean, I've lost numerous sleep overnight on all these issues and fights and committees I had to pass at KBC Bank. But once you've reached a certain level of uh, maturity and um, yeah, reputation, I would even call it reputation, within a certain financial institution, as, as I think we've managed to do it with mm -hmm. Saluzio within KBC, suddenly and you have to get give credit to the bank as well. They also go through a learning curve. For them also, it's new to work mm. with, with fintechs. But suddenly they come to a point like, woo, so Luzio, you've, you've managed to deliver some products for us and it works and customers buy it. Why don't we go to Central Europe? Why even don't we go beyond KBC and we go to Raiffeisen? That's actually the discussion we're having right now. So it's, uh, it's also a matter of learning curve for the banks. So but give them also a bit yeah. of credit. I mean, that's also one of what I wanted to add from yeah. our experience. But that's very interesting in the case of also corporate venturing. And yeah. because you were entrepreneurs that were put well, into the, the, or you, you, you yeah, came from the startup? Yeah, that's also a bit or? of a difference. If I, if I hear you talk, I believe you're a founder and you're a shareholder. Yeah. Big point. Yeah. We are not. I mean, we are independent contractors. Yeah. Uh, CIO, I'm the CEO of the company. Yeah. But we're not shareholders. Yeah. Did you give your heart in it then? Yes, <laughs> stranger, but well done. No, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, and that's also a big difference in in in, for example, the IP discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Growth discussions, uh, but still, we we gave our heart to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, even though I'm not a shareholder, but we've managed to put the company to a different level. And actually, now we're talking. We're coming to the discussion. Hey guys, maybe you earn a part of ownership in the company. That's, yeah. So that's a reverse story. That's also as nice. long as they now the valuation is yeah. high. Because they're <laughs> happy. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting, mo it's a different model in the corporate venture. Because You're corporate venture, you can put an entrepreneur and that, you know, the carrot is yeah. also yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, we were part actually of hired to yeah. step into that company, not as an owner, but as an entrepreneur to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it can work. I mean, we're a good example of that it worked. Yeah? But if you would ask the CIO of KBC Group, Eddie Klutz, for example, all the pros and benefits, I mean, he would write a book on that, on all the things. Like you, fintech entrepreneurs, also write it from your point of view. Yeah, but also <laughs> the banks yeah. have their... Yeah. But yeah. then just, is there just a last question, is it then possible for that, for your company, also to have a contracting relationship with another bank? Or, or is KBC really it's like, a, we are here It's an ongoing point on in our board of directors. Should we stay, for example, now KBC uh, exclusive? Yeah, so we deliver... Uh, yeah, finished goods to KBC Bank, and it's actually the KBC bankers. They sell our product to their entire corporate banking portfolio. 80,000 companies, that's our fishing point, a uh, fishing pond for our yeah. product. But now they're reaching the point within the board, like, hey guys, this product is actually pretty successful, why don't we go beyond KBC? Yeah. Yeah. And now the discussion starts, I, I believe it, like maybe we are selling out a potential diamond for the future or we're giving out a very good beyond banking source of revenue. Yeah. Yes, because the trust should be in the two sides, that KBC yeah. wants to sell to another bank, but that the other bank are, is saying, okay, we yeah, trust, trust that, that the data thing, is... Yeah. Okay, but why, that's do you, why do you think KBC did it this way, or Eric, but, but uh, rather than the other way around, that you yeah. have a fintech company and acquiring it later once they have a scale? Yeah. Yeah, what was the biggest it? advantage for KBC to do it this way? Huh. Walter, you were at the start. I only <laughs> came a bit. I, why did they do but it? I I think mean, that they we're get part, actually, of the data the strategy of KBC. We did. Yeah. I mean, 
KBC, like any other bank, they have a data strategy. They want to collect data and build very nice, funny products and yeah. products mm. with, which make a lot of money. So it's keeping it in-house, basically. And we are, yeah, and we are yeah, actually the data collector. That's what we do. We collect data from external sources. We s with client consent, we, give it, we sell it to KBC. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and maybe, indeed, it's about ownership of the IP. It's about ownership of the data. Uh, and as such, yeah, maybe that's why they put equity majority part in our venture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we will have to round up. We, we still mm -hmm. have a, a five good minutes. Any? Is there any any other feedback from from the audience? Or if I can ask, maybe you for having like one closing sentence on on the topic and what you really want, uh, you know, to as a last moment to share. Uh, or like an, advi an advice, or like you more. I think again, just uh, going ahead quickly. I think that we're uh, when you're like super tiny company, like a startup, you're always looking to to grow, and you're also looking out for opportunities where so you're, uh, you're more influenceable. But you've got you're creating good spirits, and as you grow up, you define your product market market fit. But you will always be looking to for that partnership that will send you to the high uh, uh, high heights, mm -hmm. which which we're still looking uh, somehow. And so I think that we need, we're, we're found to find win-win situations. And I'm sure that if a corporate offers me potentially access to their portfolio, I'm willing to give them like potentially a good chunk of that, I don't know, the IP shares, whatever. And I think that we're all looking out, listening for good opportunities and also trying to discover ourselves, each other, uh, reducing the risk, as, as I said. So well, I think that we need to keep the conversation going. Uh, everything is still on the table. Uh, and I'm sure and truly believe it that we can still find nice win-win collaborations yeah, uh, uh, mm. together. That together make, could make us like reach for the high, uh, for the sky. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thomas, maybe you. And so you can also yeah, say that the name of the company will change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I won't be there like, whoop. <laughs> I, would, I would even actually ask uh, maybe a rhetorical question is that where is where is this all going to end this collaboration are we <coughs> are we really going to see shake up of the current status quo where you have the the sharks or the whales as you want to call them the big banks and and you have little fish collaborating circling challenger banks coming in. But, but the market share these guys are taking are still if you look at the numbers still fairly tiny right is this all going to change because of all the technology innovations, all everything we talked about here? Or is this going to remain like this? The JP Morgans are always going to be the JP Morgans. I think for the time being, if, if Europe remains as fragmented as it is regulatory-wise, uh, and it could be even made worse if, if Brexit uh, kind of events uh, repeat themselves, I think in that case it will be difficult for a true European fintech unicorn to really become as powerful as, as what you're uh, probably referring to, and more like the GAFA type of organization. So if, if the status quo holds, and I think yeah, it's quite realistic to say that the banks will remain the, the king makers or, or the decision makers for, for the near future, the foreseeable future, that's, that's my, my view. There are initiatives uh, from the European Commission to try and mm -hmm. harmonize uh, the, the, the regulatory playing field and make sure that a fintech can become pan-European much quicker. But for the time being, we're clearly not there yet. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of discussions uh, on open banking, using open banking, yeah. of course, in the last few years to, to spark competition, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Did that happen? There was ambiguous articles uh, recently. I think it's still too early to say, I would say, also. I mean... Mm. Just recently early. opened up. I mean, we have, I mean, ten licenses or so in the Netherlands or so, maybe or mm -hmm. less. So that's not a lot, and th that's maybe also just uh, underpinning your statement. Then, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's my. Like I said, I don't think we need an answer to this, but yeah. it's a rhetorical question. It's, this is all good, but is this going to change something? I think I think fintech will never win the the trust war. Uh, I think that uh, the GAFAs versus the incumbents. I think we're far away from winning the trust stamp towards fintech. And that's why fintech need also the bank. Yeah. We are successful in selling our product because we build on the trust that KBC mm. is giving to its customer. They sell trust. We sell a, a very nice working technology, but they sell the trust that it works. Quick survey. Any of you bank here with banks or bank or uh, depending on which country, one of the challenger banks? New banks. Uh. New, New banks. banks. New banks. One, maybe <coughs> two, three, four. 
I have a, a small account, but not as my main financial account, just yeah. to... Uh, and then we work in the technology, so imagine mm -hmm. the everyday Joe on the street. They yeah. bank with the bad views. That's it. No, but it's interesting what you said, so it's more like how can more the fintechs and the banks in Europe have more closer collaboration in order to, you know, stand in front of these GAFAs who are, who are doing it. Yeah. So that would be a good topic for next year on the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, as, as another uh, closing statement, I would say that uh, in, t in terms of the, the theme of today was collaboration. I think still, given the, the trends we've seen, um, and the fact that partnerships are on the rise very quickly, we also have the, the COVID impact, everything mm -hmm. becoming more and more digital more quickly. We see banks still very eager to cut their cost to income ratios. So whether you're a fintech that has uh, an interesting product to sell, to make the bank more attractive in a certain market uh, share, or whether you're a fintech that can uh, make a bank more or an insurance firm more efficient. Um, I think there's today's uh, and, and today's a good time to pitch. I think the the, the market uh, well, the market is in your favor, uh, but of course um, you will have to do your homework as a fin fintech. That's uh, not going to go away. So prepare for uh, for the questionnaires that you will inevitably uh, be receiving. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think uh, we can wrap up. At uh, we are well on time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the, the rest of the afternoon. Yep. Thank you.